today I have a, a, a fellow cop that I have been uh, following on social media and uh, he, his commentary is just fantastic. He says what a lot of us are thinking, not just what other cops are thinking, but he says what Americans are thinking. And he does it a way that is, is, uh, is incredibly insightful, uh, very often funny. And uh, he's just a terrific guy that I thought our audience needed to get to know. Um, Zeke Arkham, cop with an attitude, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me on. So I wanna get right to it. I'm gonna ask you one of the two dreaded questions that everyone asks a cop in a social situation. Um, okay. Those questions are, why did you become a cop? And have you ever shot anybody? So we're not gonna talk <laughs> about your shooting experience, <laughs> but Zeke, why did you become a cop? Well, it's actually the funniest story. Um, I had an office job that I hated. It was a uh, architectural sales firm. I would show, I would start my tour at eight o'clock or my shift at eight o'clock and immediately say, okay, I've got eight hours to go before I get to go home. <laughs> no, I, I hated it. So um, I actually, I, I had become friends with a cop and he was, he basically sold me on a job. And uh, to the chagrin of cops everywhere, I'll admit, I actually applied to the police department and the fire department at the same time. Um, and the only reason I'm a cop today is because the police department called me first. <laughs> well, so, okay, so you've been on the job for 15 years and uh, um, you, you picked 15 years here where there has been so much happening. Law enforcement um, in your 15 year career has become increasingly politicized and vilified and, uh, uh, and you, you have seen it all as a, as a working cop. Um, would you, would you still recommend the job to a young person who is in an office job they hate, or they're about to get out of college and they're wondering what to do? Do you still think this is a job that we want to, that people want to do? Um, wow. Uh, yes and no. Um, if you can find a department that has your back, this is a great job. Um, you know, if you can find a government that that actually endorses cops and, and lets cops do their job, great. In certain other cities, maybe not. Um, you know, I, I do mentor a lot of guys that are applying for the job. And I've had to pull a few of them aside and say, you know what, in good faith, in, in, in trying to look out for you, I don't know if I can really recommend this job anymore in this city. But if you can find some place in other cities, and I've done, helped them do the research, um, you know, then this is a great job. This, I still believe that law enforcement, being a cop, uh, being part of a police department is an honorable profession. Um, I still believe that it's noble. I still believe that we are the quote unquote white knights of the world, the last ones left. But um, in certain cities, it, they're making it very hard to do your job. So Zeke, we lived through the uh, the 2020 summer of riots and looting and burning and and all that. You lived through it, uh, uh, you know, right right on the line, watching all that happening. And uh, um, now we uh, we've lived through the Capitol riot, which was a, a horrible happening. It was one day for a few hours. A, a law enforcement officer did die in the riots. In the riot. But now all of a sudden, that is appears to be that I can read in the media, pretty much the only violent riot that has occurred in the United States in, 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 in the last, I don't know, five years. <laughs> What's your thoughts on that as a, as a law enforcement officer? And a law enforcement officer who's watched rioting and looting and burning and violence, talk about that. I not only watched it, I had a front row seat. <laughs> I, I, I worked it. Um, you know, like, it baffles my mind that now all of a sudden people are against riots when they basically encourage them for the entire summer. You know, you've got quote on top of quote on top of quote from these different politicians and elected officials that are encouraging riots, that are making it seem like, you know, we're living in this world where, where there's a huge disparity between justice for all and, and oppression, I mean, you know, and then you've got these riots in DC where because it directly affected them, 
now they're like, whoa, wait, wait a minute, this is horrible, <laughs> you know? And it's like, cops could have told you for the past couple of months, yeah, this is horrible. Um, you know, and then you've got the, the two-facedness where now all of a sudden they enjoy law enforcement. They're, they're very appreciative of law enforcement where before they were, they were condemning law enforcement any chance they got. Um, you know, we, for, for, the, for cops, this is nothing new because we went through months of this. You know, you know me and just even me personally getting stuff thrown at me, water bottles filled with concrete, uh, miles of cocktails, uh, vehicles being burned, vehicles being taken over and driven down the street, um, you know, by people that weren't, weren't cops, um, precincts being taken over, just being attacked randomly out in the street. You know, you couldn't walk somewhere by yourself. You had to go with a group because you could get randomly attacked. You know, so for cops, this is nothing new. But, you know, you had these elected officials who experienced it for, I think, a grand total of two hours. They're now trying to pretend like, you know, they went through the Vietnam War. And, and it's, it's it, it, to me, it, it's, it's almost like the height of hypocrisy. You know, you didn't appreciate us then. Now you appreciate us because we basically stood in between you and what you fear. And I give it about another week and a half or so before they're right back to condemning us. It's going to, all it's going to be is the next officer involved shooting that they don't like. And, exactly. Uh, and we're going to go back to, to, from being the angels and the heroes to the devils once again, which is kind of our life. I, I was a cop for 29 years and, and it was always up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, you know, and the media has a real tendency not uh, to not tell the truth about law enforcement. A great example we're seeing right now is uh, some of those riots that we saw this uh, this summer and fall uh, were in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, because of the shooting of uh, Jacob Blake. Now, Jacob Blake is on a bizarre media tour um, with every mainstream outlet having him on. And, uh, and now what he is doing is he is he's now admitted on national TV that he did have a knife, that he did fight with cops with a knife in his hand. He did drop the knife and was picking it back up as he was jumping into his ex-girlfriend's car that he had sexually assaulted uh, a few weeks earlier and uh, was going to take off with her kids. He's admitting all of this and I have yet to see the apology from the politicians or the media uh, in, or the media uh, who relentlessly attacked the officer that was forced to shoot him. Well, they're, they're not going to apologize. And to be completely honest, they're barely going to cover his admittance of having a weapon because it disrupts their narrative. Um, you know, <clears throat> once the media goes from wanting to tell the truth and the unbiased truth to we have to sell newspapers and we have to basically create a story that means they're no longer the news media. That means they're now fictional writers. And I've said that for a long time. Um, you know, if you're just getting your news from one source, you're not really getting the, the, the news. You're, you're not getting the complete truth. Um, I, I encourage people, do your own research. You know, look into different <clears throat> media outlets, ones that you agree with, ones that you don't agree with. Get the complete story. Um, Jacob Blake is no saint. He's no angel. And, you know, the fact that you've got that, that there was so much support behind them without the whole story coming out, um, you know, just because it, it, it fed into some sort of outrage, some sort of, you know, quote unquote, justified outrage, you know, the, the media, I, the media is now friend and cops have known this for a long time. You know, there have been instances that I've been personally involved in uh, uh, where I've been there personally and I've seen the media put their spin on these stories. And I'm going, wait a minute, that's not true. Um, and I think every cop has experienced that. And I think people are now starting to sort of wake up to, to the fact that the media is heavily biased. And it's not for the American people, it's against it. Well, yeah, I think the, uh, in, uh, in polling, recent polling, I think the only uh, people that have a lower rating than the American media is Congress, as far as popularity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and speaking of polling, who keeps polling high? American law enforcement. There, there is poll after poll after poll um, where people say, don't defund my police. Please put more police in my neighborhoods. 
Um, and again, those polls are kind of, they're kind of pushed down and, uh, and, and, and then other polls come out. Oh, are cops racist? I, Zeke, is the American justice system systemically racist? Can you, can you answer that for me? If it is, I haven't seen it at all. And, I, and I've got 15 years of court experience. I've made a lot of rest of my career. You know, I've sat through trials. I've sat through court proceedings. <clears throat> and I've seen, I've seen no evidence of systemic racism. You know, I've even asked before, you know, where is this systemic racism taking place and who's doing it? You know, please let me know in 2020, where is this systemic racism taking place? And, you know, I usually get the answers, oh, well, back during slavery. Okay, let me ask that again. In 2020, <laughs> to my knowledge, there is no slavery going on in the United States of America right now. In 2020, where is this systemic racism taking place? Oh, well, during the civil rights era, okay, let me, let me, let me stop you again. Let me ask again. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I haven't been able to find any proof of it. Um, as far as defunding the police, if you notice the people that are screaming the loudest for defunding the police live in neighborhoods where there really isn't much of a police presence, you know, because they've got their gated communities, they've got their private security, they've got, you know, their neighborhood watch programs, um, you know, even here in New York, uh, there was a stop question first program that was going on for a long time. Um, and as soon as it was ended, well, I mean, not so much ended, but you know, as soon as they put so many limitations on it that cops stopped doing it, um, we started getting people in the community coming back to us going, hey, can you start that back up again? Can you, uh, you, know, can you, can you do that all over again? J just because they were able to see how crime was rising in their neighborhoods. And, it, and it's happening again. You know, you want to defund the police, you want to uplift criminals, and the people that are being directly affected by it are like, wait a minute, we didn't ask for this. You know, can you stop that? And this is what's going on. Yeah, one of the things about defunding or reimagining policing is there's a, a, there's, you know, and there's talk about, oh, we need more training, you know, and implicit bias and, and nonsensical things like that. And uh, less and less training when it comes to utilizing force. And yet what gets us into trouble with the politicians and the media and all that is when we have to use force. So I think we're coming now to a time and, I, and it's, I'm so sad to have to say this, but it's what you just said. Cops are going to be forced to not be proactive. We're going to be those people who show up and take a report for insurance purposes or whatever. And, and when it comes to violent crime, that's just not tenable. You know, one of the big things about the best things about being a law enforcement officer is you get to respond to that violent 911 call and you get to save somebody. Now we're gonna, we're instead of blasting in there and saving that victim, now we're going to have to sort of roll in there, assess the situation, and think more about our own lives and our own families and our own situations than we are the victims. And I, that's horrific to me. It absolutely is. I mean, you know, it, most cops I know, 99.9% .9 of the cops I know are what you call good cops. When they show up, when they do their jobs, when they go home, you know, when they make their corner safer. You know, when I worked, when I walked a foot post when I first got on the job, you know, my sergeant who, who had over 20 years on said, you want to make your post the safest one there. And you want to make people feel good about you standing there on that corner. You want to make people feel safe because you're there on that corner. And um, we're getting to a point now where you can't do that. You're basically just a totem who just stands there and, and, you know, you let the crime go on around you. And once the crime is done, you, Hey, do you need a report? <laughs> you know, we're no longer the crime stoppers where, you know, we just, we sit, we watch and we go, okay, you know, it's, it's going to take that one major lawsuit. And I, and I hope I'm wrong about this. It's going to take that one major lawsuit against the cop where he loses everything. And every other cop is going to go, I'm not doing this anymore. And I, it's, like I said, I hope I'm wrong. I'm hope that, common sense prevails way before then, but this is what I see happening. And it, it absolutely breaks my heart for a profession that I've done for 15 years and served honorably. And other cops I know that have served way longer than I have 
that are seeing a destruction of a career for political reasons, for, for clout. We have seemed to, uh, we have lost the ability to talk about criminality. It's almost like we're not allowed to talk about criminality. When you look at all of the, you know, every controversial officer-involved shooting, uh, police use of force situation, there's, now there is never a discussion of why the police and the citizen, you know, the bad guy, were in contact in the first place. Why don't we talk about criminality anymore? Because it's not cool to, to put, to put the, uh, the pressure on the people that are actually committing the crimes. You know, like I said, I grew up in a rough neighborhood. I went to school, I came home. Those are my two options. I, or, you know, on weekends I played outside with some of my friends and I had friends growing up that did more than that. You know, they got involved in different drugs and different gangs and things like that. Um, I've never been arrested. They have, you know, and, and you know, whose fault is that? You know, we grew up in the same exact situations. You know, we had the same types of opportunities presented towards us. I've never been arrested because I don't commit crimes. You know, I, I, I get into debates with people sometimes about the uh, for-profit prisons. And my answer to them is always, you know, hey, listen, if you are so incensed by for-profit prisons and you want to eliminate them so badly, don't commit crimes, you know? It, it's literally something where you have to commit a crime <laughs> to be put into this prison. And if you don't commit a crime, you're defunding this prison directly by not being put in it. <laughs> you know, like, it to, so me, it's an easy answer. <laughs> yeah, to me, it's an easy answer. You know, if, if you want to eliminate these, these places so badly, don't commit crimes. You know, I've never been in a situation where I've had to rob a liquor store or, or you know, or rob a person walking down the street, <laughs> you know, I've never, you know, I've always been able to go, okay, I need to find a job, I need to do something to make money, you know, but um, you've got this, you've got this society, this culture nowadays, where everyone wants to be coddled, everyone wants to be hugged and told it's not their fault, and it's not that bad, and you did nothing wrong, you know, when you actually have done things wrong. Um, you know, if you look at every police shooting that happened in this past year, <clears throat> I can guarantee you that if, if you broke them all down, you would see a justifiable reason why the cops had to take force, why the cops had to use deadly physical force. Um, whether it's an unarmed person who, who is 250 pounds and is going up against a cop that is, you know, 150 pounds, and this person is saying, I'm not going back to jail, and you're going to have to literally kill me in order to take me back. Um, whether it's a situation where the person has a weapon, whether it's a situation where the person is using a car as a weapon against the police. Or, you know, if, if you actually look at the story rather than just say, you know, white cop shoots unarmed black man and there's all this rage and outrage and, you know, you know kneeling, you know, for the flag and, and <clears throat> people want to, you know, race bait and, and do other things. Um, if you actually looked at the story and broke it down and did responsible journalism, you would see that it's, it's not, you know, police aren't the problem. Um, criminals are the problem, which is what I've always said. Last question. Um, and <coughs> you and I are both real Second Amendment people. And, uh, and you know, we're, we're entering a year here in 2021 that I think we're going to see... Um, some attacks on our Second Amendment rights, and and you are in a position where, as a law enforcement officer, you know you work for the government, and um, you may be put in a difficult situation, like all of our you know nine hundred thousand brothers and sisters out there around the United States. What does a potential attack on our Second Amendment mean? Do you think for American law enforcement? Well, uh, I mean, for me, it's not that hard of a decision at all. Um, the Second Amendment, my, my oath is to the Constitution. So um, the Second Amendment, <clears throat> excuse me, being part of our Bill of Rights, uh, to me, to me, I, I, I've always said I will neither obey or give an order to confiscate guns from law-abiding citizens. Um, that's just not part of my oath. That would be going against my oath. Um, it's just not, to me, it's not a morally responsible thing to do. 
Um, I'm, I'm very pro Second Amendment. Um, I think I was asked before, hey, listen, you know, if someone had a tank, is it covered under the Second Amendment? Yeah, well, go ahead, drive that tank down the street. Matter of fact, you know, hey, hey I know how to drive stick. I'll drive, you know, <laughs> give me a ride, you know. Um, you know, the Second Amendment is what protects, what protects our rights. It directly protects the First Amendment. Um, to me, it's not a hard decision at all. Um, I'm very pro Second Amendment. I, I've always said that. Um, the only hard part for me would be that I know that there are cops that would go along with it. And I'd have to stand against my brothers and sisters in blue to say, this is wrong. We cannot do this. And my message has always been for every cop, remember your oath. Your oath is to the constitution. Your oath is to the people, wherever you serve. Your oath is not to singular politicians. Your oath is not to one man's ego, or one woman's ego. Your oath is to the Constitution. Your oath is to the United States. Your oath is to the people you serve. Your oath is to each other. Remember that always. And don't let anyone pull you away from that. Zeke Arkham, people need to read and hear more of what you have to say on a regular basis. Where can they find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter right now at Zeke Arkham and my podcast, Reasonable Suspicion. Uh, we have a new episode coming out soon. Um, also, I'm Zeke Arkham across every platform, across Instagram, across Twitter. Um, so you can find me there. See, thanks for spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. This year, over 50,000 law enforcement officers have been assaulted while on duty. A vast number of these attacks were filmed and uploaded to social media in the pursuit of likes and attention. What they want to do is film you instead of like, what can I do to help this officer? Together, we can change this disturbing trend. If that individual would have hit the right spot, you know, it, it could have been it for me. You know, last time I would have saw my wife, my kids. I'm Mike Solon. Law enforcement officers need your support. If you see an officer under attack, then follow these simple steps in order to help. One, call 911 and give the officer's exact location. Two, Ask the officer if you can assist. If the officer accepts, then do whatever you can do to safely help. Three, if the officer declines, then start filming and be a good witness. It's time to stop filming and start helping.